Well, good evening. How are you tonight? Hey, Jacob. Thank you, Bobby. It, 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 one person in the room. It, how are you tonight? Good. Well, let's worship together. Let's stand as we sing. Well, good evening. Let's try that again. Good evening. All right. It's good to see you all tonight. I'm glad that you've come on our Wednesday night worship. 
Um, anybody need a, a pick-me-up? Or is everybody feeling, yep, we all need a pick-me-up? Picking me up there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Jacob, nice shirt. What does it say? Blessed is the nation whose Lord, excuse me, whose God is the Lord. Amen. Uh, as we come tonight, I want us to be mindful. Y'all know that Miss Patsy McDermott is uh, still in the hospital. Those of you who have been keeping up with that, Miss Patsy was put in there and had to be put on a ventilator, but she is taken off the ventilator. And I spoke to her daughter, um, was it yesterday or today that I spoke? I can't remember. I'm, I'm losing track of time. But anyway, um, no, I think maybe it was a text that she sent me early this morning that she is doing well. She actually was talking to her, but she thought she was on a plane and a train. And I said, well, I hope wherever she's going, she's, got, she's having a good trip. So, um, but y'all do. I think she is doing better, but we need to continue to pray for Miss Patsy as, uh, as she is recovering there in the hospital. And let's pray for Stephanie Domingo. That is Miss Millie's daughter. Um, Stephanie, of course, has had a lot of health issues. And uh, how old is Stephanie? Like in her 40s? Um, anyway, she is having some problems with, I guess it's a blood, it's a bacteria in her blood, and um, she is in ICU, and um, we need to remember Stephanie Domingo, that's Miss Millie's daughter, and she is having a lot of health issues right now uh, uh, as she's in the hospital. So let's, let's pray for her. Miss Sandra. Oh my goodness. Well, we will definitely pray for Miss Teresa in that. She's at the hospital now. Okay, we will definitely pray for Miss Teresa. Okay. All right. Um, let's pray for our nation. I don't want to rehash all the news. If you've been watching the news, we've got a lot of crazy stuff happening in our nation now. We need to pray for our nation and uh, just pray that God would be, uh, we need some mercy. And um, we need a lot of other stuff too. But we need to be praying for our nation. So... Okay, so that was the update from Miss Millie about Stephanie. It's just been a really bad afternoon. She's been very agitated and, uh, and depressed. Um, so we, we really need to be praying for them. All right, well, it's good to see you all tonight. I'm glad that you're here. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer and just pray for his hand of blessing and to watch over these. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne of grace, we want to thank you for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you. And, uh, Lord, we can lay our burdens before you. Lord, I want to just pray for our church family, what we are seeing with some sickness within our church family, Lord, a few folks that are in the hospital. Lord, I lift up Miss Patsy to you. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will touch her and that you will completely heal her body and that very soon that she will be able to get out. Lord, we, we pray for Stephanie Domingo, Lord, Miss Millie's daughter and would just pray to your God that you will touch her body and that you will bring healing and that everything would be fine with her. We, Lord, know that she's in a very serious situation, but we trust you, Lord, uh, in your, your grace, your mercy, and Jesus, that you are the great physician that you will touch and that you will heal. And Lord, for Miss Teresa, we, we pray for her, Lord, whatever it is that's going on, Lord, we know that you are uh, aware of all things. Lord, you knew this before it was going to happen. So we pray for Miss Teresa and ask that everything would be fine with her and that you would deliver her from, from whatever infirmity this is that she is experiencing. And Lord, I do want to pray for our nation. Um, Lord, we, we so desperately need you. Lord, we need a touch from you. And I pray, dear God, that you will, you will just move in a powerful way. And Lord, just help us to be reminded as the church that we have a responsibility to be faithful. Lord, we may not like the things that are going on around us, but, Lord, um, 
uh, many generations of believers have had to go through difficult times. And Lord, in these difficult times, Lord, we are called to keep our eyes upon you. Uh, Jesus, you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And I pray, dear God, that we will not grow weary in well-doing, but that we will keep pressing forward and be faithful to what you have called us to. And Lord, as we come tonight, let us be reminded of that. The promises that you've given us, the call that you have to us to go into all the world. And Lord, I pray that tonight that we will be refreshed and that we will be re-energized to go out for the rest of this week. And Lord, to be a witness to you into this world. Lord, thank you. We pray for your presence tonight as we come before you to sing praises and as we uh, proclaim your word tonight. May you be glorified in all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> no, but I did see part of the funeral. <laughs> 300 great grandchildren? I wish you could have seen your faces when he said 300. <laughs> that was entertaining, though, just a little. Well, let's stand. Let's continue to worship.
Just real quick, as the pastor comes by a show of hands, how many of y'all, that's the first time you've ever sung wrong? Okay, thank you. Hey, I'm, I'm committed to the theology of the old hymn. Amen? Amen. Amen. So maybe you're going to be learning some new ones here in the future. <laughs> All right. Thank you, David. Um, so... Uh, Talking about the singing, I was uh, sharing with you about the um, the funeral for um, Grandma Yoder and the singing. Nathan sent me a video of the singing in that service. And Thurman, were you there? I will be honest with you, I've never heard such singing. Were y'all there? I've never heard such singing in all my life in a um, at a funeral. And uh, it was, uh, I guess they do it, I don't know what they call it, is it like four part what do they call it acapella four part harmony which means that what does that mean <laughs> i know what acapella means okay it was good i mean i don't know what it was but it was good and um i'm telling you david it would have just brought you to tears if the congregation would have sung sung out and um and again it wasn't a it was a funeral and uh you know at funerals a lot of times people don't typically sing but it was um it was beautiful i have heard i have uh tuned in before and heard some of the mennonite singing they've got different groups and stuff and they are a a very musically talented people in in how they sing so that was that was good um 
All right, so tonight I'm going to um, deal with some issues that may be a little sensitive because we're going to talk about how Satan is destroying our homes. And I know we've got our young people in here, but the, the fact of the matter is uh, we, we oftentimes think that our young kids that we got to kind of hide them from some things and don't teach it to them. And the reality is when they go to school, they're hearing stuff that would probably blow your mind. And so uh, I think one of the problems is we're not teaching our kids. And um, so tonight I want to deal with some things. Um, but if you want to destroy a nation, how do you destroy a nation? You destroy, you destroy the home. If you can destroy the home, you can destroy the nation. And our nation is falling apart because the home fell apart many years ago. And what Satan wants to do is to have dysfunctional marriages that produce dysfunctional children. And, um, and, and that's working pretty well for him. How many of you know that we're all dysfunctional to some degree? If you don't, just ask somebody who knows you. Go to them and say, am I a little bit dysfunctional? And unless they're really kind and willing to lie to you, they're going to say, no, you're not dysfunctional, but you are. We are all dysfunctional. Why are we dysfunctional? What does it mean to be dysfunctional? It means you don't function the way that you're supposed to function. God created man and woman to, to function in a certain way. And since the fall of Adam and Eve, we have not functioned the way that we need to function. Even as Christians, do we sometimes malfunction? We do. And, and so I, I want us to look at this, and I want you to think about what we're seeing in our nation and everything that you're looking at today. And there is so much that is going on that I'll be honest with you, I am, I'm about to blow a gasket. I'm, I am so ready for Jesus to come back and take care of things. But we've got to recognize that what we're seeing in our government, what we're seeing in our schools, what we're seeing in our society, what we're, all these things that we're seeing, we've had a breakdown in the home. And if we had homes that were not so broken, we wouldn't have a nation that is so broken. I'm convinced of that. And so if we're going to try to fix things, you don't start by trying to fix what is the result, where it's the, 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 um, the effect you got to fix the cause. And so I want us to look at this tonight. And, um, and I, this is not exhaustive, what we're going to be looking at. I'm going to show you what Satan has done through Scripture, what Satan has done to destroy so many homes. There's more than this. We don't have time to go into all of what it was. This will be the last message that I do as we have been going through Wearsby's book on... Um, on uh, Satan's way of uh, how he operates. And so we're going to talk this, tonight about how Satan is destroying the homes. And I want us to look. Here's, if you're taking notes, here is the first way that Satan is destroying the homes. Again, this is not exhaustive, but this is one of the ways that Satan is doing it. Satan has redefined marriage. How many of you knew that? Satan has redefined what marriage is to the point that we don't even need marriage today. Um... Let me, let me give you this. How many of you ever heard of something called a social construct? Have you heard that used in, the, in, in the, a lot of the talking today that people will say, well, that's a social construct. Let me tell you what a social construct is, and I'll give you a, an analogy on this of something that happened. But a social construct is what is said to be an idea that has been created and accepted by the people in a society. So society constructs something, and it's called a social construct. Now, let me tell you, the first time I heard somebody use this in a real-life situation, and I had gone over, there was a, a ministry need, I was over at a, uh, someone's house, and there was a young lady who showed up, and um, she, she had a child, and she was not married. And the lady who was there, who... Uh, who, who lived there at the house, when this young lady came in, she's, she was, uh, they were very good friends, and she was talking to her and said, um, you know, ask her how she was doing, how the child was doing. And, and this lady, who was an older lady, made the comment to this younger lady, when are you going to get this situation rectified? 
Meaning, when are you going to get married? And here's what this young lady said. Marriage is just a social construct. And what she meant by that is that it has no value. This is something that some people just came up with an idea that marriage is something that we just kind of came up with. And my first thought on that was, and I, and I know I shouldn't have judged, but I did. I was looking, here's this young lady, and I don't think she had a job. She wasn't married. And my thought was this, welfare is also a social construct, but you probably don't have any problem with that. But you got this problem with this social construct called marriage, what you say is a social construct. Well, let, let me give you this. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 20. And y'all just need to be aware, a lot of this crazy stuff that we're hearing, I'll be seeing and hearing, you're going to hear that word social construct, and it's a way for the left to discount anything that they don't like. Oh, and, and we'll see some other things that they call social constructs, and it's not. So in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 20, and we're getting some rain out there right now. Praise the Lord. All right. I'm happy with the rain out there as long as we don't have lightning in here. We'll be fine. So Genesis chapter 2 and verse 20. Um, so Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man... And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. At that moment, what did Eve become to Adam? His wife. And then, verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, can I tell you that society had not started yet. And what did God do? God did a wedding ceremony for a husband and a wife. And so marriage, I want you to hear this, marriage is not a social construct. It is, in fact, a heavenly covenant. It is a covenant between two people and God. So a, it's a three-way covenant that is made. Now, here's what some people will say. Well, that only counts if you're, if you're a Christian and you want to follow what the Bible says. Um, that only Christians are bound by this thing called marriage. Do you think that's the way God looks at it? No, it's not. And let me give you a great example of that. Y'all remember in Scripture a man by the name of Herod? And you remember a, in Scripture a man by the name of John the Baptist? And John the Baptist lost his head. Why did he lose his head? Because he said to Herod who had taken his brother Philip's wife, her name was Herodias, and they were not believers. And John the Baptist said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. It didn't matter if he wasn't a believer. The fact of the matter is, he was still subject to God's law, and he broke that law. Herodias certainly didn't like it, and you know the story how he lost his head in that incident. So when you look at marriage, marriage is not a social construct. It is something that was instituted by God himself. All right? So this whole re redefinition of marriage, here's where I'm going to kind of go with this. In the society in which we live, let me go back. In Scripture, how did God view marriage? A man shall leave his mother and father, cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So you got a man and you got a woman. Okay? And that is the only thing that God says is a valid marriage in his eyes. So now what we've done is we've come along and people will say, well, um, gender is a social construct. And so actually... What you'll hear the left say is that gender is a social construct and that you can identify for whatever, whatever way that you want to identify. And we're hearing this. 
And you can simply do whatever you want to do. And then you've got this person who a man who identifies as a woman. And so he's a woman and he can marry this man. And, and, and so really he's got a wife and we can do... I, I want to show you something here. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 5 verse 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 5 verse 1 and 2. It says, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him into the likeness of God. He created them how? Male and female. And blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. Now, I'm just going to say this. You have the absolute right to believe whatever you want to believe. And I'm, I'm not going to sit there and tell somebody. In fact, I, I want to live in a society where people have the right to believe what they want to believe. I don't think it's right to make anybody believe something they don't want to believe. I don't believe it's right to force anybody. You can't force anybody to be a Christian. And I would never ever do that to try to force anybody to be a Christian. But here's what I'm going to say. If you profess to be a Christian, by making that profession of a Christian what you have said is that the standard, what the, the, the rule book is God's word. You don't have the right to call yourself a Christian and redefine what God has said in his word. So if you want to say that, well, I think it's okay if people want to live like that, that's fine. You can believe that, but do not equate it with God's word and say that God says it's okay because God does not. So this whole thing now that we've gone from that you can... You can do, we can call marriage whatever we want to call it, and we can call gender whatever we want to call it. You, and by the way, have y'all noticed how things have, um, this is a danger, and you need to understand this, because this is so, if you have not seen or read the book, 1984, you need to read it. And how the definition of things just absolutely changed by the whim of those who are in control. And what we're seeing is if they don't like the way this is, you just change the definition. I, say, I used this as an illustration the other day. Anybody know what the definition of a recession is? Two quarters of negative growth. Well, that was the old definition. But when it didn't fit the, the current administration's desire, you just changed the definition. And so what we're seeing today is we're changing, and hear this, redefining whatever we want to to make it say what we want it to. And so whatever it is today, tomorrow it can change. And I want you to hear this. This is exactly what Satan has done with marriage. For, for literally since the creation of time, when you look at any society, you never go back to see a society. In fact, this was brought up in 2008 at the Supreme Court when we were looking at marriage and the Supreme Court made the decision to just uh, to allow gay marriage and one of the questions that was asked was has there ever been a time where any society has ever affirmed anything other than marriage of a man and a woman and guess what the answer to that is no they have not the first time we have come to this time in our society and we're redefining literally thousands of years of precedent. But again, why was it between a man and a woman? Because of what God did there in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And so one of the things that we're seeing happening is that there is this redefinition of marriage. Now, let me just say this. People say, well, that's Old Testament. You know, we, we don't go by the Old Testament, which I don't, I don't agree with that. I think that there is a lot to the Old Testament that that still is very valid i'm not saying that everything applies to us there were things that were ceremonial laws that don't apply to us but certainly the moral law applies to us but i want you to look what jesus said here in mark chapter 10 and verse 6 jesus affirms the definition and makes makes it clear that neither marriage nor gender is a social construct Verse 6, from the beginning of the creation. That means all the way back. From the beginning of creation, God made them what? Male and female. It's not a social construct. It was the way that God created it. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his what? 
wife. And the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. And so we see here in the New Testament that Jesus affirms what the Old Testament says about marriage. And what Satan has done today is he's redefined marriage. In fact, what we're looking at, and this is one of the sad things. Do you know what many people who wanted to redefine marriage used it as an example of why they should be able to redefine marriage? That we as Christians say, well, no, marriage is sacred. And do you know what the, the world would say to us as Christians when we as Christians were saying marriage is sacred and it's only between a man and a woman? When we said it was sacred, guess how they came back at us? Well, if it's so sacred, why are there so many Christians that get divorces? Well, how do you answer that? To some degree, they've got a, they've got a point. Are we going to practice what we preach when we say that marriage is sacred, but yet we're going to just arbitrarily divorce? In fact, the divorce rate among Christians is what I understand the same as it is amongst the loss. Why is that? Satan is attacking marriage. You've got to understand that. So Satan has redefined marriage. That's one way he's destroying our homes. But here's another way. Satan has reversed headship in the home. Now this always gets a little bit... People get a little bit antsy when you start talking about this. When you start talking about roles within the family. All right, I'm going to ask you all a question. Who's called biblically to lead the home? The man or the woman? The man is. Now, I didn't ask you what your thought was on who should lead the home. I asked you what the scriptures say. Again, you have the right to believe anything that you want to. And I'm going to make a really good point here at the very last of this. So y'all hang on to that. You literally have the right to make any choice that you want to make. But how many of you know you have the right to make the choice, but you don't get to choose the consequences? I'm just telling you. I've got, I've got 51 years of living. I don't have as much living as some of you. But at least in these 51 years, I have learned this. If I stay true to God's word, life is so much easier. It doesn't mean that everything is going to, to be easy in life. But it is amazing that if you hold to God's word, how things just seem to go well. But part of the, here's, here's the thing, Satan has re, uh, reversed headship. Part of the problem in the home is that we have no defined leader within the home. People enter into marriage without any idea who's going to steer the ship. So when you're, a, and, and I think most of us in here, our, our younger ones have not been married. Um, hopefully one day you'll all find a great spouse and get married. But um, marriage is a journey. Would you all agree with that? And on that journey, you go through some treacherous waters. Would anybody disagree with that? And somebody's got to steer that ship. Now, here's the question. Who's going to steer the ship? So if you've got a situation where the husband says, I'm going to steer this ship, and the wife says, no, 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 I'm going to steer this ship, and you're sitting there and you're constantly battling about who's going to steer the ship, would that work on an actual boat? It wouldn't. And it's not going to work in an actual marriage. Let me show you some things here. All right. So here's what I like to ask people uh, when they're entering into marriage. Well, who's going to lead this thing? And, and you will typically see this a lot now. The, as the younger generation is coming along, the more they buy into this thing, well, you know, we'll make the decision together. Now, I got no problem with a husband and a wife Sitting down, in fact, I would say that communication is one of the keys to a good marriage. Communicate. Um, and do you know what I found out most of the time in my marriage with Laura? I would say most of the time we're on the same page. How many of you have always been on the same page with your spouse every single time in every decision you've ever made? If you have, if you and your spouse are always on the same page, one of you's not thinking. There is going to be something called a disagreement. And so when I ask somebody, okay, so mutually you're going to make this decision, but who makes the decision when you're not going to agree? And there are going to be those times that you don't agree. Well, um, that's when things can get a little bit hairy. And that's when, and if there is not a defined leadership, 
then what's going to happen is that's where, that's where the fighting starts. And that's where the animosity begins. And then the animosity sets in and the division sets in. And, and you know what the word division means? It means two visions. And you can have division that will lead to divorce. And it all started because we had a disagreement and we, and, and we didn't have defined leadership. So here's my question. Does God give us defined leadership in marriage? The answer is absolutely. Now listen, you may not agree with what God says, but the fact of the matter is that Scripture is not ambiguous about where this leadership is. So what's our problem? I talked about this one time before, and I thought it was really interesting. So let me go back. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. And here is um, what happened. This is, the fall has taken place, and um, at the fall, you know what happened? Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and um, it's what we call theologically the fall. It's where sin enters into the human race and when God confronts them he confronts Satan as the serpent he confronts um, Eve and he confronts Adam and God gives a curse to all three of them what was the curse that God gave to Eve here it is look in verse 16 and to the woman he said I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception in pain you shall bring forth children. So that's the one thing. Um, golly, I wouldn't want to have to have a baby. I've said that if men had babies, they would the ones that would have it would only have one, and after his buddy talked to him, his buddy wouldn't have any. Man, I ain't going through that. So <laughs> it, there is pain in labor. And what it appears is that it came as a result of the curse. But that's not the one I want to point to here. Here's what I want to point to. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. What does it mean that your desire shall be for your husband? It doesn't mean that you're going to, to look at your husband with longing eyes and want to embrace him in some passionate hug. That's not what that means. If you want to understand what that means, look over to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7 because we see this within the same context. Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. Um, Cain and Abel. Y'all know the story there. And as God, it, when, when they brought their sacrifices and um, the Lord was not pleased with Cain's, and the Lord said to him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door. And hear this, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Do you notice that is exactly what God says to Cain here is exactly the curse that was given to Eve. So what is the context? What is it that sin desires to do in your life? We are in what? Bondage to sin. Sin wants to rule over you. Sin's, what he says here is when he says sin's desire is for you, says this, sin wants to rule your life. We've all experienced that, where sin wants to rule over us. And so what he says here is here's the curse. Your desire is going to be to rule over your husband, but he's going to do what? What does he say the husband will do? He will rule over you. And so I told y'all when I preached on this, and I don't remember when this was, the reason why we have such conflict in marriage is because of the curse. And I want to tell you that even though we as Christians that we are saved from our sins, we still live in a fallen world and every marriage is affected by this curse. And so you get a husband and a wife together and, and then we're all in agreement until we're not. And, and the wife says, well, I'm, this is what I'm going to do and you're not going to tell me what to do. I watched my, I watch my daddy tell my mama what to do and I watched how he was, and no man will ever do that to me. 
Anybody ever heard that kind of stuff? And so what we've got is we've got generation after generation after generation. And I'll be honest with you. We haven't done, guys, we haven't really done what we're supposed to do. And I'll get into that in a moment. And so there's this fight that takes place. And so it starts with the disagreement. And then there's division. And then there's divorce. So what does God say that is supposed to happen here? Look with me in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. Again, you keep this in mind. I'm telling you what Satan tries to do. And he's trying to redefine headship in the home. Who's going to make the decision whenever it comes down to it? Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, my, I would dare say that you're probably not going to hear that verse preached a lot in your churches today. Why is that? That is way too offensive in the society in which we live. We don't like that word submit. And let me say this. Can I tell you it is not simply a matter of husband and wife. We don't like that word submission at all in our society. We think it's a negative thing. We think it's derogatory to have submission. Um, and so when he says here, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is, my goodness, look what he says here, head of what? The wife. Now, do you think that society looks at that and says, yeah, that's really good. In fact, you know what, do you know what um, people say about Paul? They don't like Paul. You know what they will call Paul? There's a word that starts with an M. Misogynistic. They said that Paul did not like women. In fact, a lot of your liberal theologians, real liberal theologians, who just pulled junk out of the air, will say that Paul was actually a closet homosexual and hated women, is what they will try to say. But Paul says, you know, he says, um, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is also head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. And so he's giving this thing about headship here. And again, I'm just telling you, if you in your life choose not to obey God, that's totally your choice. But if you say, you know what, I want to I go by what Scripture says here. And I want to do what God says. And I, I want, here, you say this, I really do want my family to not be dysfunctional. The way for your family to not be dysfunctional is to operate in the way that God said to function. And so what God says here in the functioning is, husbands or wives, you need to submit to your husbands. You are the, you are the, here's what he's saying, you are the spiritual leader in this home. You are to lead your family. Now here's what, we focus on that, and I really do believe that the next part usually makes this better in a home. But here's what he says. Um, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So what's the responsibilities here? What does he tell the wife to do? Submit to your husband. And what does he tell the husband to do? Love your wife. Um, I am convinced of this. Now, this is not true every single time, but I am convinced that most women who have a very loving husband who love their wives as Christ loved the church, that it is a much easier thing for them to submit to their wife. And by the way, guys, let me just go ahead and just tell all of you that where it says to submit, you cannot make your wife submit. The way this is done here is this is the decision that the wife has to make. She has to, this is where her relationship with God is. And, and what she has to make the decision is, am I, am I going to submit to the leadership of my husband? Now, guys, I'm going to tell you, it makes it a whole lot easier for a wife to submit to the leadership of her husband if it is godly, loving leadership. Now, is a woman, so let's say you're a, you're a Christian woman, and you have a husband, and he's not a believer, um, at what point do you not submit to his leadership? Is there a point when a godly woman should not submit to her husband's leadership? And I would say yes. 
I would say if there is anything illegal or immoral, it's kind of like this. Are we called to submit to government? We are. We are called to obey the governing authorities until what? Until they call for us to do something that goes against our belief system and what and how we practice our faith in the Lord. At that point, we are no longer to submit to our government. And, and it may cost us our life. And so there is this thing called headship. And we live in a society that refuses to do this. And again, you have the right to make your choices, but you don't get to choose your consequences. Um, so Satan has redefined what, what headship is. And what Satan says is this. There's no headship. You both do what you want to do. If you have ever been in any organization, if you ever worked anywhere, how does it work when there is no defined leadership? There's chaos. Somebody, did I hear somebody say chaos? There's chaos. You can, I love what Adrian Rogers said. Anything in nature that you find with two heads is a freak. It is a freak of nature and it will not work. Again, all I'm doing is giving you what Scripture says here. You can make the decision to do whatever you want to do. You can make that choice, but you don't get to choose the consequences. We have a society today that says we're not going to follow biblical principles because that's outdated. And somebody want to tell me where our family... Has that worked well for us or not worked well for us? Hasn't worked at all. All right, so the third thing that we see here is not only do we see that Satan has reversed headship, but Satan has ruined intimacy in the marriage. Now this gets a little bit, but our, our kids here, I'll be delicate on this. Y'all turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. And listen to what, what Paul writes here. He says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over his uh, excuse me, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now, you see how Paul, when he's talking about intimacy here, what Paul says about how this relationship works? Golly, if we didn't have youth in here, I could really... So here, here, here's what happens in the marriage. And when it comes to intimacy, um, anybody want to guess, when, when Paul is talking about this here, verse 5, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and praying and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. All right, so here's what Paul says. When there is a lack of intimacy within the marriage... Can that lead to temptation outside the marriage? It absolutely can. That's what he's talking about here. I don't know what the statistics are, but not every marriage ends in divorce because of unfaithfulness, but my guess is that unfaithfulness is the, one of the primary causes of divorce. And so this, Paul is talking about intimacy here. And he's telling the couples, listen, you've got to be very careful how you handle your, this, this intimate relationship that you have. You know, you, you can't say, gosh. Do y'all understand where I'm coming from? <laughs> Here's the point that I want you to see. When the intimacy is not there and the the physical needs are not being met, people will oftentimes go looking somewhere else to fulfill that. And I believe that one of the things that Satan is doing today is couples, we don't even like talking about it. I mean, I'm struggling up here right now talking about this. It's not something that we like to talk about, but can I tell you it is something that is very, very much that we need to talk about. In our guys' group, we do talk about this a little bit more. Um, your ladies' groups, I hope y'all talk about it more. 
When y'all get older, we'll talk about it more. But the fact of the matter is, I'm aware of this, they probably hear more at school than what we would, than what you and I heard at school. So here's the thing, and I want to just, I'm, I'm going to hit this here real quick. Does anybody want to try to guess what a real, real, real big problem that destroys intimacy between a married couple today? Hear this, it's pornography. Um, did y'all know that so many of our young men today have no desire to be in a relationship with a woman because they have been exposed to so much stuff? And you don't realize how detrimental pornography is to the mind and how it, it rewires. There's all kinds of studies out there that show how pornography rewires the mind and you cannot function in an intimate way the way God designed it. And I'm telling you, it is all out there. Y'all remember we used to say this, and you used to have to go hunt that stuff down. You don't have to hunt it down anymore. It'll hunt you down. And, and so when you look at this, what Paul is talking about, he's ruined intimacy within the marriage that Satan will do whatever he can to destroy that. And the temptation that he says here, um, come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. There's a huge temptation that is out there. All right, so that's the third thing. Let me give you this fourth one here real quick, and I think it's an important one. And this one really hits, well, I know with our family, Laura chose to, and we made the decision together, that, that um, when Savannah was born, she retired from nursing. So she's been retired for, how old is Savannah? She's how old? Wow. I'm getting old. Savannah's 24. Laura retired just before she was born. We could have made more money. In fact, there was times that the money from a nursing would have been a lot better. But let me show you this. Look with me in 1 Timothy. And here's what. Satan has reviled motherhood. Um, motherhood is something that is looked down upon in our society today. And let me show you what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 14. Now, they were, the early church was operating in such a way, this is actually talking about the widows here, and he's given instruction how you watch over the widows. And listen to what the instruction that he gives to young widows. And it was probably not, it was not uncommon for a, a woman to be a widow young, probably more common then than it is now. But what does Paul say here in verse 14? Therefore, I desire that the younger widows do what? Marry? Bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So what is it that Paul, what does he say for these young women what's really good for them? Marry, bear children, and do what? Manage the house. All right, now before you think I'm going to go off on a sermon that say all women need to be barefoot and pregnant in the home, that is not where this is going. So listen to this. There is nothing that says a woman should not work outside the home. Nothing in Scripture that says a woman should not work outside the home. But I believe that one of the things that you better be very much aware of is that if a woman does work outside of the home, be very, very careful that you watch where Satan will bring in a lot into the home that can go wrong. Um... I'll give you this illustration. Uh, there was a man that, as at the first church that we pastored there at Pine Grove, and he was up north, and and they had a um, a plant there, and um, they were having problems. And I'm not even going to go into what the problems were, but they realized that the men and the women were 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 having times of intimacy. The workers, and so what they had to do to fix it was they sent they literally sent the men to work at I mean to lunch at one hour of the day and the women at another hour of the day. Because when they were working together it was too much of a temptation and it happened. We definitely saw this that when women started entering into the workplace, they're there with other men, 
and more of an opportunity for Satan. So I'm not saying that a woman should not work outside the home. Uh, home. All I'm saying is this. Just note that it can raise for some very difficult circumstances. And here's the other circumstance. Any of you ever heard of something called a latchkey kid? Y'all know what a latchkey kid is? It's those kids that come home after school and they go home and they're totally unsupervised. Do, who do you think wants those kids to be unsupervised? Satan does. And I really do believe this. If you were to ask me, and I'm not saying this because, because we made this choice, I'm saying this because I absolutely believe it, that, that we have demeaned what it means to be a mother. We have said that a mother, that the woman who, who chooses to raise her kids, what we have said is, well, you're not reaching your full potential. Have you ever heard this, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world? I'm telling you, who's got the greatest influence in our society? I'm convinced it's the mother. And, and so when we began to, to consider this, um, this was a quote that Wearsby gave, and I thought this was a great quote. When outside the home is more inviting and exciting than inside the home, then you can be sure that Satan is at work to wreck that marriage. And what he was saying is this, that for the wife, when it's more exciting to be outside the home and, and then to be inside the home, you've got some problems. There ought to be an excitement for both the husband and the wife with their family. And not to feel like, oh, well, I would much rather be out there. You see, here's what's happening. We're, we have society today looks at being a stay-at-home mom as nothing. You're not reaching your potential. In fact, having children is seen as destroying the environment. How many of you, how many of you have heard enough to know that? If you have children today, you are destroying the environment. I've heard stories of young women who have never had children who will get their tubes tied just so they don't leave a carbon footprint. They will not bring a child into the world because you're going to destroy the environment. And here's the other thing, is they'll say that not working outside the home makes a woman dependent on the man. Uh, how many of you know that dependency goes both ways? All right, in some ways my wife is dependent upon me. If you were to ask me, is she dependent upon you for money? Yeah. Yeah. But we have this thing where we've got a really good system going. I give her the debit card, and she just spends whatever she wants to. And if she, oversp <laughs> if she overspends, baby, you've got to be careful. Um, it's not my money. And I want you all to tell, tell you, even though I'm the primary moneymaker, it's, I, we never have viewed it as my money. When Laura was the one making the money, whenever she was putting me through seminary, she would bring her check and she would give it to me. Because she didn't like dealing with the finances. But anytime you start saying, well, this is mine and this is mine, you're in trouble. It's not my money. It's as much hers as it is mine. So in that regard, she is dependent upon me. But can I tell you something? In many ways, I'm extremely dependent upon her. When I was going through my severe anxiety only one person that I wanted around, and it was my wife. I, and I didn't just want her around, I needed her. I had to go to the doctor today. I've, I'm 51 now. It's time to get the colonoscopy. I had to go to the doctor, and we were talking about things, and they were starting to ask me questions, and this and this and this, and I made the comment, this is why Laura is supposed to be here. And Miss Carol Davis, who was there, she said, yeah, I was wondering why she didn't come today. I said, she had to go pick the kids up. I said, but usually she's here. Why? Because I need her there. And so can I say this to you? What's wrong with being dependent upon somebody? I'm very much dependent upon my wife in some things. In some things, she's very much dependent upon me. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And don't let society tell you anything different. Well, the one thing I think we have to do is quit making this thing a competition between husbands and wives. It's not a competition. It's teamwork. We're working on the same team. We should be. And what Satan wants to do is he wants to, to split the team. Now, I'm going to say this. You may not like what Scripture tells you. You may not like how God says to do this thing. 
And you got every right to do it the way that you want to do it, but I promise you, God's way is best. Let me give you this as an example. How many of y'all have noticed in my 20 years of being here as the pastor, I'm not as small as I used to be? Lynn, that hand went up quick. I'm probably, I'm probably about 30 pounds heavier now than what I was when I first came. And it used to be that all I had to do when I was a young man, just go out and exercise. You could drink all the Cokes that you wanted, eat all the pies that you wanted, and there was no problem whatsoever, high metabolism, no problem whatsoever. And, and, and I hit a point, I thought, well, I'll just continue to exercise. It wasn't working. Here's what I found out. I talked to somebody, and I was really listening to them. Man, you got to cut your carbs and your sugar. That's not what I wanted to hear. I love Little Debbie's. I love them. I love cookies. I love cakes. I love all that kind of stuff. But I heard something I didn't want to hear. you got to quit doing that. And I did it. I started doing it. I've lost six pounds. How many of you could see that? <laughs> my point is this. The way to fix my problem, the advice given to me was not what I wanted to hear. But when I started following the advice, it was exactly what I needed to hear. When we look at Scripture, listen, God may not be telling you what you want to hear, but I promise you, if you will do what God says, it's exactly what you need to hear. If we want to fix what's happening in our society, can I tell you what we're doing right now? Does somebody want to make the argument that what we're doing right now is working? It's not. It's failing miserably. And you would think that with our society in absolute shambles, that somebody would think, God said there's a certain way that we ought to do it. Let's do it. I'm an advocate for that. Satan wants to destroy the family. But God has given us instructions of how to restore the family. If we do what God says, I promise you it'll work. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time that you've given us. Lord, I know that we deal with stuff here now that goes against the grain of society. But Lord, just help us to see your, your word is true. Your word is faithful. And Lord, if we simply do what you tell us to do. Lord, it doesn't mean that we'll go without problems. But it does tell us how to deal with each and every problem that we have. Help us to be faithful to what you called us to in all that we do. And Lord, help our marriages. Lord, as we relate to one another as husband and wife, Lord, as we relate to our children, as child to parent, so much dysfunction. We would pray, O oh God, that you will heal our families, and Lord, that you will heal our land. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, sorry, we went over about 10 minutes, so next week I'll end at 720.